Hi, this is Dr. Joe Chaffin, and this is another Blood Bank Guy Podlet. Today we're going to do a 10-minute tutorial on the famous Acquired B phenotype. Now, I call it famous because it is a very popular topic on standardized exams. The reality is we don't actually see, the, see it all that often in actual practice. But since we need to be familiar with it, let's take a quick tour. Basically, we're going to look at first at the basics of ABO biochemistry and testing, just to make sure we're all on the same page. We're going to do the pathophysiology of acquired B, as well as recognition and confirmation and management of acquired B a little bit at the end. In terms of the basics, when we look at the surface of the red cells, what we see is that ABO antigens are built on these chains, which are known as type 2 chains, primarily. There's some other types as well, but primarily type 2 chains. They're glyco glycolipids and glycoproteins, a mixture, and they have a couple characteristics. The very last sugar on a type 2 chain by itself is a galactose. Right next to that is an N-acetylglucosamine. Probably not enormously important to remember that, uh, but it is important to recognize that the, the way that these two sugars fit together is with a beta-1-4 linkage, and that is partly what makes this a type 2 chain. The type 1 chain, on the other hand, which is floats around free in plasma and in secretions, actually has a little bit of a different binding between those last two sugars, a beta-1-3 linkage. Anyway, that's a topic for another day. Moving on, once you have a type 2 chain, before you make either A or B antigen, you have to first make the H antigen, and that is done through the action of what's called a fucosal transferase. Fucosal transferase is an enzyme that puts a fucose onto that terminal galactose and changes this whole chain into an H antigen. Now once you make H, then you can move on and make either A or B antigens. And here's how it's done. It's all done through the action of enzymes. The A enzyme, or the A transferase, is actually an enzyme which adds a particular sugar, an N-acetylgalactosamine, to that terminal galactose, and it changes that entire chain from the H antigen into the A antigen. In a similar way, uh, with group B, the, uh, the enzyme is a galactosyl transferase, so it puts on a galactose and changes the chain again from H into B. Now, if you'll notice, the N-acetylgalactosamine and the galactose actually look pretty similar, and I've shown you the structures there. The important part to focus on the left side of the screen is the, the part in red. The n, -acetyl, uh, the n acetyl portion of N-acetylgalactosamine is the NH-COCH3 at the bottom there, while the galactose simply has a hydroxyl, or OH group, done at the bottom. That may not seem like a massive biochemical difference, but the, the consequences of that difference are enormous, as we're hopefully we're all well aware in the ABO blood group system. In terms of how this fits together, well, let's just take you back to high school science. Everybody's aware of this, I would hope, that people, for example, who are blood group A, have on the surface of their red cells the A antigen, and as a result, they carry in their plasma anti-B. That little, that little, uh, thing there is called Lonsteiner's Law. Basically, you have the opposite antibody as you do antigens, and it follows through the ABO blood group system. Now, Lonsteiner's Law can be used, actually, to do the testing that we do, routine ABO testing. Most of you are familiar with this again. First, you have the cell grouping, or the forward grouping, or also called the front typing, where the patient's red cells are reacted with reagent anti-A and anti-B. On the other hand, the serum grouping, or the reverse grouping, or most, most commonly, the back typing, takes the patient's serum, or plasma, and reacts it against reagent A1 cells and B cells. Now, for example, in blood group A, what you would expect to see is strong reaction with the anti-A on the patient's red cells, and then no reaction with anti-B, but on, those, on the serum grouping, you would see the fact that this person has a strong anti-B would give you a strong reaction with B cells and not A1 cells. Again, I know that's review for most of you, but just, just to make sure we're speaking the same language. Moving on to acquired B itself, well, how does this happen? It happens almost always in a clinical situation of a blood group A patient, especially blood group A1, where their red cells are coming in contact with enteric bacteria, bacteria from the gastrointestinal system, especially colorectal cancer. That's the classic presentation of someone with acquired B. However, other forms of, of uh, enteric cancer, such as stomach cancer, can do the same thing. GI obstruction, gram-negative sepsis, all these things have in common the fact that these red cells are in contact with these bacteria, some of which carry D-acetylase enzymes. Now, what does a D-acetylase enzyme do? Well, it's 
let's look up here at someone who's blood group A who has that N-acetylgalactosamine as their terminal or immunodominant sugar. As you can imagine, a D-acetylase enzyme does exactly what its name says. It catalyzes the removal of the acetyl group from N-acetylgalactosamine, and what's left behind is the acetyl group floating free and galactosamine. Galactosamine is that gal NH2 down there at the bottom, and when you look at that sugar, that's exactly what gives us the problem in acquired B, because that sugar is no longer the A sugar. So in other words, the chain does not have A antigenic activity, and it's not really B, but it's kind of close to B. Notice that the, the, the image on the left, the, it, rather than a hydroxyl group for plain galactose, you have an amino group, the NH2. So, galac, so galactose amine is what gives this whole sugar the, the features of the so-called acquired B antigen. Important questions that we have to ask about acquired B. Is it really B? Well, no, it's not, but it looks like it because most forms of human anti-B will very weakly agglutinate these, these uh, acquired B cells. Now, that's especially true when the, the serum is actually very fresh. The older the serum gets, the less agglutination you have. And in fact, a few monoclonal anti-Bs will do that as well. Historically, there was one particular clone that was widely used uh, called ES4. The ES4 clone at body pH would agglutinate acquired B cells wonderfully, so much so in fact that it caused that it caused some problems that we'll talk about later. However, we know that it really is not a, a actual B for a couple of reasons. First, the patient's own anti-B, remember this is a blood group A person, so they have a strong anti-B, the person's own anti-B will not agglutinate those acquired B cells. I'll show you that in just a second. And the change is temporary. In other words, uh, the A antigens will be changed into acquired B, and over the course of time, as the infection resolves in this hypothetical example I'm showing you, things will reverse and you'll get loss of that acquired B and the chains will change back to, to A. Now you should know that what I've just described to you with the deacetylase enzyme is the classic form of acquired B, the most widely known. However, there is another way that this can happen uh, where bacteria actually produce B-like lipopolysaccharides. And so they make these lipopolysaccharides that just passively stick onto group O red cells and change them into looking like group B. It turns out that's probably mostly an in vitro phenomenon, doesn't really appear to cause as much problems in actual patients. So let's leave it alone. Now how about, how do we recognize acquired B. Recognition and then later confirmation of acquired B, it, it classically presents just like you see on this slide here, where you have uh, the, the ABO grouping, the ABO testing, I should say, of an individual, and in the circled in red, you see an aberrant reaction. In other words, a weak one plus reaction with anti-B in this otherwise group A person. And just a little clue on ABO discrepancies, anytime you see a weak reaction like that, that's usually where you should foc your, focus your attention because that's typically the problem. If you were interpreting this, you'd say that this person looks like AB, but the B is somewhat questionable, and on this, the reverse grouping or the serum grouping, it looks like A. And Anytime you see that, I always tell people, check the diagnosis, especially on an examination, to tell you the truth, because something like this in association with a patient with colon cancer will really sounds like acquired B, again, even though you don't see it all that often in real life. This is an example, acquired B, of an ABO discrepancy. In particular, it's an ABO discrepancy where you have an extra antigen or an apparent extra antigen. This whole topic is a topic for another day. We'll do that another time. But let's move on and let's talk about how we confirm acquired B. Well, I'm gonna talk about the first two real fast, a different clone and then secretor studies, but I'll talk about the last three on their own slides in just a second. So first, if, if you have something that looks like acquired B and you happen to be one of the few people still using the ES4 clone, clone, um, well, then obviously don't do that. I mean, you can look on the package insert for someone sorry, for your monoclonal antibody, and it will typically tell you whether or not that anti-B reacts with acquired B cells. If you happen to have one that reacts, we'll try a different one. Then second, secretor studies only works on somebody who is an actual secretor. 80% of people will secrete ABO antigens in their saliva, for example. Well, if you look at the saliva of a person with acquired B, you would expect to see the A antigen, but you would not expect to see the B antigen. And so that would be helpful. Now let's move on to the other ones. Autoincubation, I mentioned this before, um, remember, if you have someone, uh, if you take human anti-B, especially fresh, and react it against acquired B cells, you're going to get weak agglutination. 
However, if you take this patient's own anti-B, which we already know reacts super well with regular group B cells, we saw that in the patient's serum grouping or reverse grouping, you react it with his own acquired B cells, which appear to be group B, you get no agglutination whatsoever. There's a lot of reasons for that, probably a topic for another day as well. Uh, but again, Patients' anti-B does not react against their own acquired B cells. The second thing that you can do, or the other trick that you can do, is you, the acetic anhydride trick. This is acquired B, again, with this, with this uh, galactosamine. You throw in acetic anhydride, which is simply a couple of acetyl groups bound with an oxygen in the middle. The COCH3 is the acetyl group. You're basically supplying a whole bunch of acetyl groups so that the, one of those acetyl groups could interact with that galactosamine and convert the whole chain back into into an A antigen by changing the cha the N sorry changing the galactosamine into N acetylgalactosamine. Finally, it, you can actually acidify human forms of anti-B, because remember we said that you'll get weak agglutination there. You take that same human anti-B and take the pH down to 6.0, then that agglutination goes away with acquired B cells, though it would still react extremely well with regular group B cells. Finally, real quick, let's finish with the management of acquired B. It's not really very hard to tell you the truth. These patients are blood group A, and so they should get blood group A red cells. Bottom line, avoid group B cells. Um, I mentioned before that the ES4 clone caused some significant problems in the past. A patient that was reported back in the 90s by Dr. Garrity and, Garrity and his group basically um, was mistyped as AB. It was a, a 92, I believe, year old uh, individual who was mistyped as blood group AB, um, given AB blood, and after the third or fourth transfusion of AB blood actually had a fatal acute hemolytic transfusion reaction because the person really was blood group A. Um, with plasma, the, plasma hasn't been studied all that much to tell you the truth. You could certainly always give someone with acquired B, AB plasma, because AB plasma can go to anybody basically, and you could almost certainly give them group A plasma as well without significant consequences. Acquired B is really most likely more of a laboratory phenomenon with the exception of those mistypes that I told you about in the past. However, we've changed our testing and we've changed the way we do things so much that acquired B rarely causes, causes us a problem in real life. Well, that's it. I hope this has been helpful. I went just a little bit beyond my promised 10 minutes, and I apologize for that. Please take note of the items here on the disclaimer. Please write me if you have any issues or questions about this podlet, and we'll be back later on with another edition. Thank you very much. Have a great day.